Police officers stabbed in Hamilton. It's the holiday season and this is an absolute tragedy. The officers rushed to hospital after being stabbed in the neck and head. A suspect now in custody will take you to the scene and they can't even take a day off to take a COVID test if they have any fear of an infection. Concerns from advocates over the lack of protection for workers at essential businesses during the second lockdown. What they want the government to do. Plus, personally, anyone has family. We can't believe it that it was an accident or oh, she hurt herself. A Pakistani activist is found dead in Toronto one day after going missing. Why those close to her believe her death is suspicious as Amnesty International calls for an immediate investigation. Good evening, I'm Kelda Yoon. We begin in Hamilton tonight where three police officers were rushed to hospital with stab wounds after a confrontation downtown. A suspect is in custody tonight facing numerous charges. Our Dali Ashri brings us the latest. A heavy police presence in downtown Hamilton tonight after four people were injured, including three police officers who were rushed to hospital with stab wounds. Hamilton police received the call shortly after three o'clock in the afternoon. The incident happened at James Street North and Robert Street. Police say citizens called in about a person in crisis who was holding a weapon. Officers engaged the gentleman. Subsequently, an altercation ensued. Three officers have been transported to local hospital with stab wounds to the neck and head. The suspect, a 24-year-old man from Oakville, was also injured. He has been charged with three counts of assault on a police officer. We spoke to some witnesses in the area who do not want to be on camera, but they say they saw a man walking up and down the streets, screaming and behaving erratically. One passerby told CBC they saw officers attempting to tase the man, but it didn't seem to be very effective. One woman who works at a business nearby says she didn't see anything, but says customers came in and told her about what happened, leaving her rattled. I get nervous about, you know, something's going on, but I know that there was a lot of cop presence, so that obviously makes me feel a little more safe. Um, but, you know, it's a busy corner of James Street. There's a lot of people going on, so relatively safe for the most part, but sad for, you know, everybody involved. It's the holiday season, and this is an absolute tragedy. Officers responded and are doing their job and subsequently have sustained injuries. The three officers are in stable condition in hospital and police say the investigation is still ongoing and are asking any witnesses or businesses in the area with security footage to come forward. Dahlia Ashri, CBC News, Hamilton. And an update to a story we brought you last night. A man has been charged with first degree murder after a fatal stabbing in a North York home. Very shocked, it's a very quiet neighborhood. We all tend to keep to ourselves, unfortunately, you know, so it's it's very disturbing. It happened on Nymark Avenue near Don Mills and Shepherd just before nine o'clock last night. When police arrived, they found a 72 year old man who they say was visiting from China with multiple stab wounds. Paramedics tried to save him, but he died in hospital shortly after a 50 year old Toronto man has been arrested. He appeared in court today. The police are referring to this as a family related incident. The investigation is still ongoing and they are asking anyone with information to come forward. Turning to the pandemic now, a lockdown across Ontario is now just four days away. Places like Toronto and Peel, though, have already spent one month under lockdown. And as you may have noticed, it's a little different compared to the spring. So how will the new province-wide measures compare to the first lockdown we had back in March? Chris Glover takes us through it. I don't care. I don't give a f anymore because I'm scared too. It got heated in Ontario during the spring lockdown, even allowing vital infrastructure and health care construction. Now, though, all construction will be allowed and no one seems to be batting an eye. So we have learned a lot uh, over the last few months. York Region's medical officer says in many instances, Ontario is reflecting the science of the moment, that the virus isn't spreading as easily outside or by children. Under the province-wide lockdown kicking in December 26th, childcare spaces won't be closed again, and parks won't be locked up either. I'm not in the business to close businesses down. I'm in the business to save lives and listen to our health experts. 
But just as he did in the spring, a reluctant premier is shuttering restaurants and lots of retail. This time, even adding closures to hardware stores and pet stores and making cannabis curbside only. But if we were to go by local data in New York region, um, I would prefer to have our retail establishments open. York Region's Dr. Kareem Kurji says retail and restaurants haven't been contributing to cases, but manufacturing warehouses, distribution, and food processing centers certainly have. In Peel Region, for example, these businesses make up more than half of all workplace COVID cases. However, they've been deemed essential. And so just like in the spring, they will stay open across Ontario. Retail and restaurants are closed. Warehouses are allowed to stay open. Do you feel like we have this backwards? Uh, I believe so. But the medical officer says the good news is the province is promising increased inspections. And his overwhelming advice does match the premier's current preoccupation. The federal government needs to immediately start testing at our international borders. It's not a hard lockdown because our borders are still quite porous. Without further action by the federal government at our borders, uh, we remain at extreme risk right now. But federal public safety minister Bill Blair fought back at the federal COVID briefing today, and he said that Canada has been among the most aggressive countries at controlling international borders. And Bill Blair said that fewer than 2% of all of Canada's COVID cases since the beginning of the pandemic have been sourced to international travel. Chris Glover, CBC News, Toronto. As Ontario prepares for a 28-day lockdown, there's concern the stricter measures won't stop COVID-19 from spreading at essential workplaces. They remain a significant source of COVID outbreaks. And as Trevor Dunn reports, advocates are looking for more protection for those workers. Essential stores, factories, food processing, online retailers and warehouses. As Ontario prepares to shut down, these essential businesses are up and running. But with no additional support included in the government's lockdown plan, advocates are concerned. I found it absolutely shocking. Provincial data shows that as of yesterday, 6,368 infections have been traced back to workplaces, many of which will remain open. Compare that to the heavily restricted bars, restaurants and gyms. They'll be shutting down province-wide on Boxing Day. But so far, just over 1,400 cases have been linked to recreational settings. With essential workplaces staying open, there's fear the infections will continue unless the government acts. You have the premier of a province announcing a province-wide lockdown who talks about how numbers of infections are skyrocketing, that this is a dire situation, and then basically tell us that essential workers will have to continue to work and provide those essential services but without the essential protection, which is paid sick days. Asked about support for essential workers who need to stay home, Premier Doug Ford today pointed to the federal program that provides $500 per week for up to two weeks. If you stay at home and you're, you're under the weather, you have COVID, you're getting paid for, for two weeks. Big box stores have remained open for the holiday shopping season as smaller businesses were forced to close. According to Walmart Canada, across the country, 699 employees have tested positive just in the month of December alone. About 90,000 people work at Walmart across the country. The store says it's taking several safety measures, including mandatory masks, capacity limits, increased cleaning and temperature checks. In Peel Region, there are also calls for paid sick days and more support for essential workplaces. I understand that Canada needs these pandemic heroes to be at work um, and we have tens of thousands of them in in Brampton but I believe there's still a lot more that can be done to have their back. Brampton is home to an Amazon fulfillment center with another two next door in Mississauga and Caledon. The company won't say how many employees have contracted COVID-19. In a statement, Amazon says it's following the advice of health officials and medical experts and taking extreme measures to ensure safety. But it says we believe that sharing a case count is misleading and lacks a significant amount of context. Trevor Dunn, CBC News, Toronto. 
There are now more than 1,000 COVID-19 patients in Ontario's hospitals. It's the first time the figure has surpassed 1,000 since May. Now, this comes as Brampton, one of the province's hardest hit regions, received their first batch of vaccines today. This marks the opening of the city's first COVID-19 vaccine clinic at Brampton Civic Hospital. The shots will be given initially to healthcare workers and staff working in long-term care homes. The first vaccine was also given in Durham and York regions today. A personal support worker at a Whitby nursing home received the dose at Lake Ridge Health. And at the Vaughan Hospital, another PSW was given that region's first shot. The Premier announced a number of new relief programs today, saying they'll help keep people home and safe. Starting January 1st, the province will lower electricity prices, offering a discounted off-peak rate. That will last for 28 days. The province is also offering more supports to help offset at-home education expenses. Starting in the new year, parents of high school students can apply for a one-time $200 payment per child. Secondary students in southern Ontario will not be back in class until at least January 25th. Well, international reaction is pouring in today after a Pakistani activist was found dead in Toronto. Karima Mehrab, also known as Karima Baloch, was found dead on Monday, one day after she was reported missing. Police say her death is not suspicious, but as Talia Ricci reports, many who knew her believe otherwise. It was really shocking in a country like Canada. We came here to uh, for safety. Latif Johar is a close friend of Karima Mehrab and a fellow activist. He says he just spent time with her last week. She was really good in good mood and very positive. And she was, we talked a lot, we joked, and she was uh, preparing for her uh, economic uh, course exam. Toronto police say her death is currently being investigated as non-criminal, and they don't believe the circumstances were suspicious. But Johar has a hard time accepting but, that. Uh, personally, and even his family, we can't believe it that it was an accident. Oh, it, she hurt herself. Mehrab has been critical of Pakistan's government and active in the struggle for autonomy in Balochistan. She was also the former head of a student group that's banned in the country. People like uh, Karima Baloch have tried to highlight the fact that the Baluchi community have been discriminated, that they have faced extrajudicial targeting, killings, murders. And in many ways, that is why she had to seek sanctuary in Canada, because she was in fear of her life. Mehrab fled Pakistan in 2015 amid terrorism charges and death threats. And Johar says just a few days ago, her husband received threatening messages. Saying to him that, uh, they will send a Christmas gift to Karima, she will never forget. And uh, they were asking all these, uh, saying, stop your activism. Amnesty International is urging the 37-year-old's death to be immediately and effectively investigated. And Pakistani High Commission in Canada says it has approached the Canadian government to know the cause of her death. We asked the federal government if it would consider intervening, given her history and tips from loved ones that she had been fielding threats. The Office of the Minister of Public Safety and Emergency Preparedness didn't respond to that question. Instead, saying in a statement, our condolences are with the family and friends of Karima Baluch during this incredibly difficult time, adding that Toronto police will provide more information as it becomes available. Johar says she was a hero to many, brave and creative, but above all helped him forget about some of the difficult losses they've both experienced. She has been... Uh... Uh, like a sister, a good friend, and uh, she was the one of the few people I could talk about my secrets. He says they plan to send her body back to Pakistan. Talia Ricci, CBC News, Toronto. York police are now investigating a fatal fire as suspicious after an investigation by the fire marshal. The homicide unit has taken over this investigation. Uh, and are now really uh, taking a deep dive into what took place, uh, who was involved potentially, and uh, they're really making this appeal for anyone who might know anything. 
The fire happened in May at a home on Burr Oak Avenue in Markham. A family of five lived there and neighbors reported hearing an explosion. Three of the residents suffered serious burns. A six-year-old boy later died of his injuries. Crews also located a 12-year-old boy deceased inside the home two days later. Police are not releasing the cause of the fire at this time, but are asking anyone with information to come forward. A 263-year-old violin that was stolen last week has been found, but police are still looking for the suspect. A police say the man is in his 50s. He was last seen on Friday exiting Dufferin Station with the violin strapped on his back. He was also seen the next day on the subway. The suspect is believed to have this Lorenzo Carcassi concert violin dating back to 1757 that went missing on Thursday. If you think you recognize him, investigators would like to hear from you. I thought it might be a good and fun distraction to start filming some tutorials with her. Downtown restaurant owner and her daughter are gaining a social media following one dish at a time. That's coming up. Plus, a major winter storm is headed our way. I'll tell you how that'll affect Christmas Eve and Christmas Day.
let's take a look outside. It's been mostly cloudy tonight with some clear breaks after a pretty mild day. Let's go to our meteorologist Nick Serkovich now. And Nick, three days before Christmas, no snow on the ground yet. That's going to change. Hi, Kelda. Well, we are tracking a major winter storm that's headed our way for southern Ontario, and this right in time for Christmas Eve. It shows up in our weather headlines. For tomorrow, mild weather, um, but that's the least of our... Um, stories here as we start getting into Thursday and Friday that's when we're talking about a major winter storm that's headed our way and I'm going to show you what we're seeing right now on the forecast models. Earlier today we had temperatures up to three degrees they are going to climb higher for tomorrow as mentioned and that associated believe it or not with this winter storm. This sort of clear area here is the warm sector of the storm and there's a warm front that pushes down just over northern Ontario and as this slides eastward we're going to see warm weather being pumped into southern Ontario as we move through tomorrow. So that's part A of this storm system. Then in behind it We've actually got a cold front that sits somewhere back around here as we head through tomorrow around midnight. Now, as this whole system pushes eastward, late tomorrow we're expecting to see rain because the temperatures are going to be well above the zero mark. Showers continue into Thursday morning, and then Thursday, heavier rainfall expected until about Thursday evening. That's when we get to this rain snow line here. Now the timing of it isn't perfect yet. There's still some variability, but this is where it gets uh, important for us in terms of our weather. Heavy rain in advance of it, rapidly dropping temperatures behind it, the risk for some isolated uh, or, uh, freezing rain in some areas, and then snowfall and windy conditions behind this into Friday morning, snow squalls set up as we head through Friday afternoon. What can we expect? Well, total rainfall uh, amounts here could be in the neighborhood of 15 to 25 millimeters, locally more. And then as that part of the system pushes eastward, we've got snow in behind it. Now, areas around London, Kitchener, Waterloo, likely to see about 15 centimeters of snow, maybe more. For the GTA, West GTA, probably about five to 10. For the city of Toronto right now, looks to be about five, but could be a bit more if the track of this system changes just a little bit. But that's generally what we're expecting to see. Further east, less in the way of snowfall as we head through Friday morning. So a lot to talk about there as we move through the next couple of days and we track this storm system. For tonight, minus 2 degrees in southwestern Ontario. Wind chills to close to minus 10, 8 tomorrow. Few showers sort of later in the afternoon. And then as we head toward the Golden Horseshoe, we're looking at temperatures tonight of uh, about minus 2. Same story. Tomorrow, plus 7 degrees, well above the seasonal mark. 20 plus millimeters of rain on Thursday, switching to snow. That lasts into Friday morning. Windy conditions. It will most definitely, for most of us, be a white Christmas by the time you wake up on Friday. Kelda. Thanks so much, Nick. The weather is brought to you by Train, the most reliable heating and cooling brand. We test, so it runs. It's hard to stop a train.
our Sounds of the Season fundraiser has reached an amazing milestone. So far, you have helped raise more than $1 million for GTA Food Banks. Take a look at that. We can't even fit the dollar sign in that graphic. We broke the graphic, basically. That's wonderful news because with the pandemic, the need is even greater this year. You can find out how to donate at cbc.ca slash SOTS. Well, like most restaurant owners in the city, Michelle Lee struggled when the pandemic hit and a lockdown forced dining rooms to close. Suddenly, her typically bustling Korean restaurant downtown sat empty. To attract more takeout customers, Michelle's daughter, Diana, encouraged her to film cooking tutorials, uploading them to social media. And they gained more than just a loyal following in the process. Take a look. The pandemic may have slowed down things a bit, but inside this kitchen, the work hasn't stopped. Hi, my name is Michelle. I am Kimchi Korea House restaurant owner. For my mom, like the restaurant is her life. Like, you know, like she said, she's here seven days a week open to close. It's been that way for Michelle Lee ever since she opened the restaurant back in 2012. Then this past March. And suddenly lockdown and I was a little scared. Her daughter Diana quickly helped to set up the restaurant on all the food delivery apps. Then she had another idea. You just would drop one. Ooh, it's ready. <laughs> I thought it might be a good and fun distraction to start filming some tutorials with her. But she really pushed me. Diana posted the videos on social media and they took off. Medium heat with about five minutes. The restaurant's Instagram has now grown to more than 5,000 followers, people loving Mama Lee's tutorials of classic Korean dishes. Kimchi pancake, seafood pancake. And also number one is kimchi. I like the red color. When we film, it's usually just the two of us in the kitchen. Is really just like a mom talking to her daughter, teaching her how to cook, and I think that feeling really comes across. So a lot of customers, I never saw it. They come and they saw me, ah, are you Mama Lee? The restaurant is doing better during this second wave, but the videos were never just about getting more business. And I really wanted to convey to people how much work that it takes for my mom to make each and every single dish at the restaurant. And it's really just a labor of love. Tonight, I'm going to show you how to make a chapte. It's brought the two of us closer together and I think a lot of times I took my mom's cooking for granted thinking I would never have to learn how to make it or you know she's always going to be around so I don't need to learn how to make it so that's what this experience has really brought for me is more in touch with the Korean side of my heritage. Thank you for watching. And that's our show for you tonight. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you back here tomorrow night at 11. Good night.